Hey guys, Miss Marusik here, and in this video we're going to talk about physical versus chemical changes. Now this is one of those topics you've heard probably since elementary or middle school, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this topic, but I am going to hit on a few highlights that you want to make sure that you know for AP Chemistry, um, as well as a few things that may challenge what you have previously learned back in middle school. So to start us off here, uh, with physical processes, we would say that the chemical composition of that substance does not change. What that means is my chemical formula is going to remain exactly the same. Now I may be changing certain physical properties about it, maybe the shape of the substance or the state of the substance or the solubility of it, but the chemical formula itself would not change and therefore the composition of that substance would remain consistent. Now typically these only involve changes in intermolecular forces. Um, for example, when I do a phase change change to something that is covalent, I would only be impacting those intermolecular forces, either breaking them or forming them, depending on what kind of phase change I'm doing. However, as we learned last unit, we do have a few phase changes that involve the breaking of bonds, depending on what kind of substance we have. So this may challenge something that you previously remember from middle school. A lot of times they simplify things and say, oh, bonds don't break with physical changes. Well, that's true most of the time, but we do have a few instances where bonds can change. For example, if I have a phase change of an ionic, metallic, or network covalent, remember on those they have such high melting and boiling points because what's happening is that I'm actually breaking bonds instead of breaking intermolecular forces. However, we would still consider those a physical process because I'm not changing the formula of that substance. I'm simply breaking the bonds in order to get it to go to a different state. So keep that in mind. It's kind of a, a little bit of a gray area there for that one. Uh, same thing goes for dissolving an ionic substance in water. Um, hopefully we remember that I would break those ionic bonds in order to form ion dipole forces with the water. And so I technically did break some bonds there. And so it's kind of again that gray area. It is technically though considered a physical change because I could reverse it very easily by just evaporating back off the water, um, as well as the fact that I didn't really change the chemical composition. Yes, I broke the bonds, but the formulas of those substances would still be considered the same. So now, on the flip side, chemical changes occur when a substance undergoes some sort of reaction and I get a new substance that's being formed. So here, what would happen is that I would change the formula that I would write for that substance, which is very different than what I would do with the physical change. Um, it says here, chemical properties change in this type of process and will result in a new chemical composition. So I won't have the same ratio of elements in my substances anymore. I'm going to change those ratios. I'm going to change those formulas up. Uh, these do involve the breaking and forming of chemical bonds. Um, so all chemical changes, you would be breaking bonds, but there are some times where you can break bonds and it be physical. So that's kind of a little bit of an overlap there. Now remember, we have some evidences of a chemical change. Those include unexpected energy changes. So a little bit different than just heating something up or cooling something down, say on a stove or in the freezer. That I would expect. Here, what we're talking about is if I put two substances substances together and I feel the container and all of a sudden it got warmer than either of the two substances started off at. And so that would be an indication that I'm releasing a great amount of energy out of that process. Um, also a gas being produced, which a lot of times we notice because we have some sort of bubbling that's taking place. Um, an unexpected color change. So not just putting food coloring into something that would just be physical because that's just dissolving. But here, imagine putting two clear solutions together and all of a sudden them turning yellow. That would be a very unexpected color change. And so that's an indication that I formed some sort of new compound or new element or whatever the case may be. 
a solid precipitate is being produced. Now with precipitates, the initial kind of look to the substance is that you'll notice a cloudiness start to build up in your solution. And that cloudiness is that solid. If I let it sit long enough, eventually the solid would settle to the bottom and I could filter it out. Uh, but the first kind of appearance of that solid does make the solution overall turn cloudy. Um, an unexpected apparent mass change. So unexpected because, again, I'm not just evaporating something where I expect to lose some mass. And apparent because hopefully we know that there's law of conservation of mass. So let me kind of talk about what this means. Let's say I had a reaction that was occurring on a balance. And for some reason, I, I didn't close that container. I left that container open. And I noticed what the mass was to begin with. And as the reaction progressed, I noticed that mass going further and further down. What that would mean is that some sort of gas was evolved, was released out of that process. And so that's why it looks like the mass has changed when in reality, I've just lost that mass to the environment. If I had put a lid on that container, I would have maintained that mass. So there really is law of conservation of mass in play. It's again, apparent mass change because it appears like that happened, even though in reality, that's not really what took place. Um, new odors being formed could also indicate a chemical change. And then finally, light being produced. Like if I'm burning something where I have a fire that's been produced, that would be an indication of a chemical change. So here's what I want y'all to do. There's a lovely list here of a combination of chemical and physical changes. And what I want you to do is to take a moment and pause the video and see if you can identify these as being a chemical or physical change. Okay, so did you pause that video? Did you go make a guess on those? I'm going to hope that you did. I'm going to go ahead and put my answers on here and you can see how you compared to mine. So first off, with evaporation, I did put that as a physical change, and that is because all I'm doing there is a phase change where I'm going from a liquid to a gas. And so most of the time that would just be breaking intermolecular forces, and I'm keeping the identity of the substance the same, even though I'm changing the state of that substance. Um, rusting is chemical. Hopefully we would notice a color change happen with that, an unexpected color change. Um, also a lot of times, uh, with that process, uh, you'll notice an apparent mass change. And the reason why is, let's say you had like a nail uh, that you ran some water or it got exposed to the air and whatever, and the rust started to collect on it. What's happening is the iron in the nail is reacting with the oxygen in the air. And so over time, it looks like that nail has gained mass when in reality, it's just obtained that mass from the atmosphere. So Again, apparent mass change, even though in reality it is being conserved. Uh, filtration is physical. All I'm trying to do there is separate a solid from some sort of liquid. I'm not changing the identity of those substances. Um, exploding would definitely be chemical. We would get an energy release and fire produced with that. Um, so those evidences are there. Um, corrosion is kind of used for metals that are not iron um, iron, we say, rusts when it reacts with the air, um, but corrosion can be used for other types of metals. Um, and so again, it's reacting with the elements, with the oxygen in the air and uh, in water that it's being exposed to. And so that would be a chemical change because I'm changing the chemical formula of those substances. Um, distillation is what we talked about last unit where I separate things based off of boiling points. But again, if I'm just boiling things and I'm just doing a phase change, then that's not changing the chemical formula of those substances. So that would just be physical. Um, same thing goes for freezing. Again, that is just simply a phase change. And so that would be a physical change. Have you figured out yet that phase changes are physical changes? Hopefully you kind of keep that in mind. Um, burning would be chemical. Again, light produced, energy produced with that. So that would be our evidence is there. Um, condensation, again, a phase change. And hopefully we figured out that phase changes are physical. Uh, tarnishing is what happens to silver when it's exposed to air. Um, it turns like a greenish, brownish kind of color depending on um, what it's exposed to. Um, and so that would be chemical because I would have, again, an unexpected color change. Uh, neutralizing is kind of a tricky one. Neutralizing is what happens when we react an acid with a base. They end up producing water and some sort of ionic salt. So because I'm changing the acid-base property, 
properties um, into making a new substance, into making water, that would be chemical. So kind of watch out for that one because that one throws people off. Um, we don't always necessarily see those evidences of a chemical change with the neutralizing, although a lot of times that process does release some amount of heat. Um, finally, we have sublimation on there. Sublimation, as a reminder, is when I go from a solid to a gas, and so that would be a physical change. So along those lines, you notice in the next example, it wants you to construct a particle diagram to represent the sublimation of dry ice CO2. So again, I want to show CO2 going from being a solid to a gas here. Um, it does mention that this is linear. Now, anytime I'm trying to draw any type of particle diagram, one of the first things I would want to do is create some sort of key for me to use in order to draw my particle diagram. So what I would do first is maybe develop some sort of symbol for carbon and for oxygen. So for carbon, I chose to use a solid circle And for the oxygen, I chose to use an open circle. You could use any shapes if you had, you know, maybe only using a black and blue ink kind of deal. Um, or you could do different colors, um, whatever the case may be. As long as you set up some sort of symbol um, for those elements, uh, it'll be very clear which element is represented by which of those symbols. All right, so take a moment and see if you can maybe draw your own kind of image here. And we'll compare here in just a second. All right, did you try drawing an image to represent sublimation? Or are you waiting for me? You're probably waiting for mine, let's be real here. So let me show you what I put. And maybe some of you put something similar if you came up with one on your own. So what I did here is I showed some dry ice, some carbon dioxide molecules. Um, and I wanted to show them as a solid, so I showed them very close together. Um, in that solid state, kind of a regular repeating pattern. And then as I went over here, I wanted to show that they were becoming a gas. But here's the key thing. Sublimation is a phase change, meaning it's physical. So I in no way want to break any kind of bonds. So you notice my molecules here look exactly the same as they do over here. I'm just spreading them out in order to change them to that gas state. Now we're gonna do some reaction, some chemical change particle diagrams in our next video. Um, in the meantime, if you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye guys.